and welcome to the Creative Heart Show, the show dedicated to the creative journey and the creative process and all the highs and the lows and everything in between. Today's guest, uh, John Webster, is a filmmaker. He's a director and a producer of all sorts of films and we're going to find out about that whole process, um, some of John's highs, his lows and uh, um, and try and kind of share some of those insights with you so that you can really get an in-depth look at filmmaking from all sorts of angles. Welcome to the studio, John. Thank you for having me, it's as lovely. they say. <laughs> <laughs> lovely to have you here. I guess a good place to start really would be at the beginning. How did John Webster get into filmmaking? Um, it probably started in 1982. Um, uh, not when I started filmmaking, but when the bug came. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be a stuntman, that was my first thing. Um, and actually, uh, a guy that lived about six doors down from us was a famous stuntman called Robert McChrystal. Mm -hmm. And he'd done stuff like the Poseidon Adventure, Bond films, Superman. Um, it, probably one of his most famous stunts was in the original Poseidon Adventure when the ship tips upside down. There's a massive stained glass window, and he's the gentleman who falls through that stained glass oh, window. Wow, okay. Yeah. And so I he, know, oh, I think I know. I've yeah, seen, yeah, yeah. I've yeah. seen him, yeah. In the original 1970s version, anyway. And um, he um, lent me a film called Hooper, which is with Burt Reynolds. And I've got to remember, I was very young. I was seven years old back then. Seven? Seven, yes. I was seven oh. years old. And the thing is, there's no DVDs. There's no nothing. We had, what, three channels back then? I think 1982, there's still only three channels. <laughs> and um, you never saw behind the scenes of films. You never saw the makings off, really. It was very, very rare. The thing about Hooper is it's all about the life of a Hollywood stuntman. So the whole film is about behind the scenes. You know, it's all about behind the scenes on a film set. And so it just looked like they were having loads of fun. One, here's a stuntman. That's what I wanted to do. And, and now you can see behind the, the set. And the thing that Burt Reynolds used to do was, was at the end of his films, um, and Jackie Chan copied him from doing this, he used to put all these mistakes, you know, all the, the, the dialogue mistakes, all the action mistakes, and it would run like with a, you know, a little square window with the text coming up. And then you would see the real movie making. So you would see the actual behind the scenes. You're watching a film about making films, but now you're seeing the real behind the scenes. And I think at seven years old, something clicked in my head that, that that's what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Well, I mean, outtakes nowadays are quite a common, quite a common feature thing, yeah. and everybody waits. I mean, I know I sit there and I wait because you kind of almost want the outtakes. Yeah, you spend yeah. the whole thing going, I can't wait to see what went wrong. Um, you know, but back then it was not Rare. done. It was, I it mean, Burt Reynolds was the first person to do it. I think, well, in my reality anyway, it could have been someone else could have started doing it before that. But Burt Reynolds used to do it for all these films. Uh, and then Jackie Chan worked with them on Cannonball Run. Uh -huh. And now Jackie Chan's become famous for every single one of his films shows all the mistakes at the end, mm. all the dialogue mistakes, and everything like that. But he, but he picked it up from, I won't say steel, but he picked it up from Burt Reynolds. Um, but he yeah. adopted it. And adopted it, yeah. And so you get to see the filmmaking process. And, and that was, to me, was the look like, the, that's when I knew, you know, in synergy, you know, when you look seven at something. Seven years seven old. Seven years old, yeah. I'm lucky because I've known my whole life. I've known. And, and forge forward, you know, my whole life to what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I've been very lucky in that outlook that I, that I've, even at high school when the teachers were saying, you're never going to get anywhere. I was like, going, but the, I'm going to be a film director, you know, I'm going to be a filmmaker. There's nothing here you can teach me. I used to say like the teachers, maths and English, that's it, you know, and everything else. And I, I think I've been proven right. I mean, go to anybody, what have you taken from high school? What do you still use? And I think math and English is about it. And everything else is all your French or your CDT or everything else just goes to the, to, to the bike. And I think so all the way through high school I knew what I wanted to be. And even at high school we used to make short films. And that was because a friend of mine had a camera, a big shoulder mount VHS camera that took big VHS tapes that used to belong to his parents. So we would sneak, borrow his parents' camera, make little short films and stuff like that at the age of 13, 14. Um, it's funny you say that because my son went to his friend yesterday. They spent, I think, from 10 till 4 and they were filmmaking. Mm. They, didn't, they aimed to make three 30-minute... Three thirty minutes. Three thirty wow. minute things on with the iPad and whatever. They didn't. Oh, I think they didn't get through the first one. I think <laughs> under, so they underestimated yeah, I think so, the yeah. work involved. Three thirty minutes. But they'd spent obviously every day at school planning it, and he was telling me the the detail mm. of what they're going to be. And mm. there's a monster, and this one's a murderer, and mm. that one's going to kill that one. I mean, they're ten, eleven years old. Oh wow! And it was a murder mystery by yeah, the sounds yeah, of yeah. it, or a murder horror sci-fi yeah. vibe. Um, so I'll have to sit through that. And I'm <laughs> hoping that the, the 30 minutes does not last 30 minutes. I don't think I can survive. But I mean, it's the same thing. They kind of know, you know, that it's an interest, isn't it? Well, the, the, the ability the, to film. He's more yeah. on the acting side of things, yeah, I okay. think. But his friend 
was very keen on directing. Mm. Do you think you've got to understand it's a different world now? You know, when I was a kid, there was, there was no cameras. I mean, especially when I first saw uh, a Hooper, mm. no one had a camera. Um, and the only cameras that were really consumer cameras then were these uh, uh, Betamax things. And they were like a, a shoulder mount camera with, a, with like a bag that goes over your shoulder and a big tape deck that clonks into it, you know, with yeah. the Betamax tape. And that, well, that was how you film. But, but they were so expensive. No one owned these things. No one had cameras. Mm. So we couldn't film even if we wanted to. And then when we came to, when I came to, because I'm originally Scottish, you know, okay. I lived in Scotland until I was 11. And then when I came to England, even then no one had cameras. It was just a pure fluke that a friend of mine's you know, um, uh, had this camera and we could actually start doing stuff. But even back then, we, the way we edited, edited, sorry, was that you would have the tape from the, ca and the camera that you shot all the raw footage. Then you'd have to do a linear edit. So at the minute we do what's called non-linear editing, which means that we can jump in at any point in the edit. We can start at the end, go back to the beginning, go mm -hmm. to the middle. Linear, obviously, is a complete opposite of that. You have to start the edit at the beginning and then keep and then edit through to the end. And because you get a, a drop in quality, so in the old days you were shooting at really low quality anyway, then when it went from the camera to the video to do your editing, you'd lose a generation. Then we'd have to put sound onto it, and that would, you know, music and whatever, and then lose another generation. So by the time you'd done all this work and finished this film, uh, what you showed at the end, even though it could have been good actors and well done, the quality was terrible, you know, because generation after generation after generation was lost in the quality. And so it was very difficult to make films, it was very difficult to do anything. And so I think for the kids today, mm. is that it's really, it's a lot easier, you know. One, every mobile phone pretty much from the last five years has got a camera on it. Mm. Cameras are really cheap, you can get full HD cameras now for £200. Editing systems are free. You can get you know the free ones, which is iMovie and uh, Movie Maker, I think, mm -hmm. on um, Windows. Yep. Um, and then even the big professional ones, I think, like Final Cut X, is only three hundred quid. So yeah, for kids today and people getting into filmmaking today, you've got it it's easy. Very, very <laughs> <laughs> you've got it. But the caveat to that is, is that filmmaking is not easy. So if you approach it thinking that it's easy, then I you've got the wrong. I think they've got the tools and they've got the technology and they can make a film, mm -hmm. but it's not filmmaking. There's mm. a big difference. I think the real art of there's an art getting to it, yeah. the art of of just having that eye for detail and knowing what's gonna kind of create the suspense mm -hmm. and be of interest and also what's gonna look appealing. Yes. that not everybody has because I still think that that is ultimately. That is what directing, yeah. to me, would be what it's about, is to know what to grab, how to grab yeah. it. And yeah. not only that, but with directing, it's how to create that because you kind of get your vision ahead of time, don't well, you? Uh, you know what you want almost before you well, start. Well, a, a director's job is this. You either come in as the, as the, just the director and so someone else has written the script and you, you're basically interpreting what the script is. So um, if, I, if I could break down basically what a director is in those basic terms uh, is that... Um, you read a book and you envision that book in a certain way inside your head and someone else reads a book and they envision it similar but almost completely different because they're referencing to different things about uh, from their past, you know, and what they've experienced. And so when they read that book, they can only use what they've ever experienced in their mind, yeah? So they can't, unless they're extrapolating and making stuff up, but normally it's, it's based on what they've already experienced. And so they see a vision of this book inside their head completely different to how you see the vision of that book inside your head. So with directors, especially when it comes to filmers, what you're paying a director for is someone who can read that script and then put their own interpretation on it, their own twist on it, add their signature to the, to the whole thing. And that's what you're doing. You're basically saying, here's a guy who can read the script, and what I like is his interpretation, because I've seen him do it before. I've seen him how he interprets things. And that's basically what a director is on that side of it. On the other side is, we can't swear on the show, can we? <laughs> go for it. Well, you sift the shit. So what it is is that when you're on a set, and when, you're, when you've got a script, you're sifting, you're looking through and thinking what's good and what's not good, what's cheesy, what's not cheesy. And that's another big job of a director is you've got to know what the zeitgeist is. You've got to know what modern, the modern filmmaking is all about. You've got to know what people are interested in mm -hmm. and it can't be cheesy, you know, unless you're making a cheesy film. And that's another part of it is that you're sifting. So when you go through the script, you're sifting all the, all the crap out. And then when you're on set, you have people coming up all the time giving you suggestions. And your job is to sift that. Your, your job as a director is not just to take on, on, board, on board what everyone's saying and not just to reject what everyone's saying. It's to take on the ideas and sift the good ones from the bad ones because it is a collaboration at the end of the day. I suppose it is. But then also, if you when, when it comes to actually shooting, because mm -hmm. I would imagine all that sifting through is not just mostly not on the day. It can. There's stuff I mean, that it happens happen on the day, day yeah, yeah. that you have to... You have to 
be really I would imagine to fight fires you have to be not real fires yeah I mean God, not on set but I mean you might yeah well you I have know, done the, I have done the past on TV shows about oh, fires really? yeah, 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 yeah. I want to hear all about that okay. in a minute but I think it's it's the being able to adapt and to be quite yes. versatile and quite you know organic with what you're responding evolve, to evolve adapt overcome that's what it nice. is. Evolve, adapt, or overcome. That's what you do as a director. On the day. Well, you think and it's in advance, you're kind of almost trying to, to, to set it up so well, that it goes as close and yes. as smoothly as you need it to be. It, or is it, that it, somebody else's job? No, no. I mean, the thing is, is that, you see, with filmmaking, is we work on so many different levels of budget, so many different levels of what we're doing, you know. Um, so uh, some people, if you've got the luxury, you can plan the day out to a T. You can plan everything out, storyboard it. Uh, get people to do animate computer program. There's computer programs that will actually animate the whole storyboard and you can see it all. You can plan it out to a T. You can go and visit the set. You can get the set or, or the location go to like that. And then when you get there on the day, you run it exactly how you planned it. Now the thing is, I'm not like that. And I used to think in the early days that I was a little bit lazy. I used to be like, I liked excitement. Yeah, we do a little bit of planning. If it's a complicated scene, we'll storyboard it. But I like getting to a set and then deciding what I'm doing. How really? I'm blocking it, how I'm covering it. Yes, and I used to think that it was just a weird thing for me. I used to think it was just like, uh. but what it was was in the early days that we used to block and plan a lot of stuff. You'd arrive on the set, one thing would go wrong or one thing was different, and then you we would quite literally get stumped. We'd be like two hours trying to figure out what we're doing because we'd planned it so well. But mm. when you're getting in there and, and you're going with what with the flow, you're going with the set, you're going with, with the actors, so you set the actors up and you, you have them in the location because you could have done a rehearsal, but it's completely different when you set them up in the 3D space and you're sitting back like a director and you're watching the rehearsal and, you're, and your mind's going, well, my, that's the way my mind works. Cover this way, I'm going to cut to that on that angle here. When she says that, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And I'm sitting watching on a wide, possibly filming on a wide, and as I'm doing that, I'm deciding how that scene's going to work. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a more complicated scene like a car chase or explosions or gunshots, they will be meticulous. They will be storyboarded out. They will be worked out in the day, all the health and safety things done. And when we get there, it, that's how it's done. But for dialogue and actors, I'm the kind of director that loves the, uh, likes it to be organic. And then I wrote, uh, read a book about famous directors. And, and it was really cool because I found out that nearly nine out of ten directors in this book, that's how they work. And Steven Spielberg used to be a real everything had to be planned out, everything had to be there. And then he worked on uh, Saving Private Ryan, I think Munich at the same time. Mm -hmm. And what it was is that he had the, the opportunity, he, he could plan Munich. And so Munich looks like an old Steven Spielberg film, you know, the way it's done. Um, but with Saving Private Ryan, he couldn't, he didn't have the luxury was, to plan I mean, that it. that was legendary. Legendary, but here we go. So he yeah. decided that he would get there on the day. So like all that Normandy beat land, and he would get there and then figure out how to block it. Then he did things like he got the camera operators, which I love, and the, the DOPs. And he said, look, just imagine on a documentary. Imagine that all this crap's going on around you. There's bullets and gunfire. And you just film whatever you want. Whip the camera around and film it, you know? And that gave it that dynamic uh, feel to the, whole, to the whole movie. And after that, he stated and said, I'm never going to go back to how I used to make films before. And, and you can see a change in his filmmaking, so Minority Report and on and on and on, because he decided that it, that it was much more organic to get in there and, yeah, plan it, plan lots of scenes, but actually some scenes you can just... I was going to say, for efficiency, I mean, his budgets, you know, you have to kind of follow a budget to, yes. a, to a degree. I think that you do need some degree of planning because anyone that thinks they can just turn up and just wing it, well, it's going to end up wasting a lot of time and a lot of yeah, money. But so there's a degree of planning, but I guess what you're saying is that the, the, the flexibility opens up a whole host. If you're too blinkered, yes, if you're you too blinkered, move, well, you, don't, you lose a lot yeah, of, yeah. of uh, good stuff. Yeah, if you're too blinkered, something can go wrong on the set. And then you're stumped, and I've seen this a hundred times. Because you haven't, yeah. Well, because you haven't planned around it, and you're, and you're not working that dynamic off. You see, I'm like, I think because I come from, a, I used to do this thing called Hapkido, and it's a martial art, and, and when you go to put a lock on, if it doesn't go on within the first two seconds, you give up and go for another lock, yeah. because there's no point in carrying on going for that lock. And I'm like that, I think, on film sets, is that we'll get there, and we'll, do what's the option, what's going on? And you look at it, and you go, let's try this, let's try it. Right, it's not working, let's completely change what we're doing. And, and doing it that way, you know, right. and... Um, and I think it, you need a lot of experience, you know, that's the, I'm well, you the luxury. You need confidence to be able to do that. You need confidence and experience. Yeah. And you need to be able to get, and that's what people want from a director anyway, that you come on set, and even if I am feeling a bit nervous or I'm feeling a bit like, oh, at my depth, 
I've got to portray an air, uh, an air of, of, of authority and of confidence and of that, you know, that, and I used to say to a lot of people on the set, like some people can start freaking out and I go, look, it's all on my head. If I'm not freaking out, then there's no reason for you to freak out at the end of the day. If you see it's me freak out, well. then start freaking. <laughs> well, do you have a way of freaking out? Do you, are you, is never. there somewhere you can go and, and no. lose it sometimes so you don't ever need no, to? No, I've never, I've never had a need to freak out like That's that or amazing. get angry or lose my temper on set or anything like that because the weird thing for me, it's like um, filming's like a drug and it's like, um, it's even like now, when you come to and do something like this, it's like the rest of the world doesn't exist. It's like you're in, you're doing something completely different. And, it, and, it, and when you know that other people is going to go out there and other people are going to see it, it just feels different, doesn't it? I know what you it? mean, because we do this and, you know, we can be at it for, not, not that the interviews take hours, but we can be set here and working on the show in whichever capacity, literally eight hours, stopping just for like 10 minutes to eat. Yeah. And you leave going, oh my goodness, where's the time gone? Because you're in that buzz yeah, and yeah, that adrenaline. Yeah. You're doing what you love. Yeah. And there's nothing better. So I totally get what you're saying. Well, you see, I'm very good but at... You hold all the pieces together. You hold the pieces you? together. But the thing is, I'm very good at it. I mean, I, I, I do talks as well. I did a talk in London another night about my new documentary and stuff like that. And, and the guy who always puts me in to do talks, he, he talks from PowerPoints. He puts PowerPoints up and he goes from frame by frame. And every time I go to a talk, he's always like, get power, organized, do a PowerPoint, blah, blah, blah. That. And I'm like, no, no, I just do my thing. I, I turn up and I just talk, you know what I mean? I've Where done you so talk? much. Where did you do the talks? Uh, there was one uh, at the Elixir Bar in Houston that we did. What uh, about? What did you talk about? We talked about the, my latest documentary that we can get onto, which is about the, the law and the legal system. Okay. And so I do talks about that as well. So people, because uh, there's this movement called the Zeitgeist Movement. I don't yep. know if you've heard of it. Uh. Well, my friend is quite high up in the Zeitgeist Movement, and he booked me to talk at Zeitgeist 2013, which was a big thing, about 800 people there. Mm -hmm. And I got booked to do talks. Actually, I turned down more than I do because I'm so busy. But yeah, Lovely. I get booked to do talks quite a lot. And so, yeah, and so I, I but where I come from is that, is that where I said to my friend James is, is that you, you're very roboticized. What I mean is that when you're talking from a PowerPoint, you're going, na, 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 this point. And I can see people, you know, people get into the chairs like that. And, and where I come from is that I've learned all this stuff. This stuff's in my brain, right? And, and, and when I come and talk, I'm up there, I'm active, I'm dynamic, I'm engaging. And yeah, I have this little problem where if I go off on one subject too much, I might forget what the original point was. But luckily, the audience, a lot of the time, they remember so where they I'm going. You. And they remind me when I come. It happened about three times the other night. But once you explain to people, I think they understand. You're, up there, you're talking well, about you're a talk million subjects. It's easy, though. When you're talking about your passion, it's very easy. And very I suppose easy, the yeah. first few times you did a talk, you maybe did plan it a little bit no, more. No, no. you never? No, never. But you're talking about your passion. You're talking about what yeah, you love yeah. to do and your project that you know inside yeah, yeah. and out. I know. That's, that's the whole point. If you know the subject inside and out, I don't think, again, but that's just the kind of person I am. I've realized that I am, I work better with my back against the wall. And but I think do that, you have an idea? You do, it's not like you just turn up with not oh giving God, any no, thought. No, no, you no, know no, exactly no. what you want yeah, to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're not talking, just to, to clarify for the viewers, you're not talking about not planning no, or no, preparing. No, 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 no. We still have rehearsals with the actors. We still go out and book, look at the locations. Are we going to build a set? Are we going to uh, go to a practical set? We go and visit that. We take photographs. We talk about I think it. that's a really you important know, point because you do plan meticulously. Yes, but... And you think it through meticulously, but then you organically go with the with flow. With the option, the it can completely change at any point. Because when I worked on other people's film sets, I found that that was the biggest holdback. There's that if something went wrong, People know, normally directors weren't confident enough, you know, and, uh, the, and the producers try to pull it together. But most producers are just business people. They don't know anything about filmmaking. And then the cameraman, the DOP gets involved. And I've seen it. I've seen a production stop for four hours just because something's happened that mm. no one had planned for. And because they're so blinkered, they don't know how to, to solve it. Whereas I've always come from my dynamic aspect, whereas I will change something very quickly. And, and it's because, and I have read recently someone wrote that, the people that succeed are the people who make decisions very quickly and take a long time to change them. And the people who seem to fail are the people who take a long time to make a decision that will change it very quickly. And I have noticed that. I've noticed that a lot, that, that, that there are people that will plan and plan and plan and plan and plan. You know what I mean? Mm. And then get to the day and then change their mind completely, but then spend another six hours trying to plan what they're doing. Whereas, I, mean, I think that's a really an interesting life lesson that a lot of people can take. Because, you know, often people are so busy procrastinating, they're thinking they're not about listening to their every angle and they're trying to work out every possible, uh, you know, permian, what's the mm -hmm. word, possible 
permutations, I can't whatever get the word permutations, yeah. They can't even, you know, and then they never get off the starting line. No. They never actually get going with anything because they're so busy planning. And yeah. then what happens as well is that they are so fixated on ticking the list off that they miss the possible direction that something will go in that could be even better. So I think that within that framework is a great way to live life. You've got, really you, 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 you've got to be, the thing is, is that what I've realized is that not everyone can do what I do. And what I mean by that is that I worked on a TV advert the other week and I'd memorized the script. I only read it twice, memorized the script. When I was on the day, I'm recalling the script to the crew and everything like that. And one of the producers is like going, well, you memorized the whole script. And I was like, it's not difficult. It's like three pages. <laughs> you that's know, your skill, is, you see. What my skill is, is that when I, I can read stuff and, and I can visualize it very visual in my head and I've got a very good long-term memory and I've realized that why I've got a very good long-term memory is that when people tell me stories I visualize it in my head I mean I see their story in my head and so it's very easy to recall and I have people flabbergasted people that I haven't met in six years and I recall a story that they've told me and they go what the hell? how do you remember but that? But you know what though I have to say I've got another angle on that as well when you are living your purpose yes. when you are doing the thing that you're meant to do and you'll feel it's not even meant to do when you feel right when you are in the zone when you're in doing what you love things just flow and yeah. that's what that's a real example yeah. of because you're doing what you want to do yes if you were given something to read because you were forced to read it and you hated what you were doing it would be horrible you yeah. wouldn't be able to do that yeah, exactly. but that's because you're in the zone and you're sponging i know I know yeah. from here, I remember things when I'm interviewing people that you think, how on earth do I remember? <laughs> yeah. Person after person after person, mm. stuff that I never knew before, mm. apart from the names. <laughs> the names I'm a bit, um, a bit shocking on. But because I'm the same, much terrible with names, but can remember, I can remember what a person's job is, where they come from, yeah. you know, what they do, what they did on the whole, summer holidays. On the, you connect in a I totally on a different to, level, yeah. Exactly. Um, and I think what I like about the organic description that you're given as well is that as a director, You've got these actors who have also interpreted what they're reading. Exactly, and that yeah. is their job is to be the character. They have studied the character. Mm -hmm. Some of them have done method acting. They are living it as well. Yeah. And I think if you're holding on too tightly as a director, you're not going to let them go exactly, where they yeah, yeah. have the potential yeah. to go with it. And actually, I think there's a lot to be said for that. You'll get a very different result yes, you get by allowing your actors well, to roll with it rather than yeah. go, oh, no, no, <laughs> cut, that's not what I want. Well, what you do is, is you give, you, normally you give them a, a character background. So when, um, when the script's been written or before it's written, hopefully someone's written a background or at least like to the characters. I mean, what I tend to do is when I'm script writing, I, don't tend, to do, I tend to do a beat sheet and then I base all the characters on friends. And what I mean by that is I don't base them 100% on friends. I base them on... I go, that's Ben, that's David, that's Mark, that's this. And the reason why you do that is, is that you always hear this about two-dimensional and three-dimensional characters. When you're writing, some people write all the characters that sound exactly the same because they're basically this coming from them. And uh, how you get three-dimensional characters is one, by writing a character background or just by the easy ways, by choosing a friend, just knowing inside your head that Mark is based on Ben and Ben is, and so on and so on. And the reason for that is, is that if any situation happens and you're writing your script, so... For example, I did this short film years ago called The End, and it's two guys come home and find out there's a nuclear war, basically TV stuck on one channel, they turn up and find out that there's been missiles fired at the UK. Um, and they start panicking. Mm -hmm. Now, the way uh, uh, that you get three-dimensionals into that is, is that you have one playing it big and one playing it small. All right? So one character's going, oh my God, oh no, we're going to die. And another one's going, oh shit, like that. And the re that gives a third dimension to it because most people might play it like both of them going off, like ah, crazy running around, or both of them being all like this. But you add a third dimension by going, well, I know how my mate, I know how I would react. I would be the shouty one. And I know my mate Ben would be all sad and like that. And so when I write it, I've now got third three dimensions to my characters. So do you write as well then? I write as well, yeah, yeah. So you, I mean, you're really the... Kind of, it's a complete <laughs> I'm, filmmaker because you're not just a director. We've touched on that. I've Some done, of what you've said sounds more producery I've done than I, my everything. stereotype of a director. Yeah. So there's the production side of it, which is you taking into account what everybody else is saying. That's more almost producerish. Well, the, the producer-director role does get kind of not blurred, but you normally work very close with your producer, or a lot of directors are the producer okay, as well. You they know, are so now more and more, aren't they? More and more, I mean, yeah. Back in the past, it was very different. different it's different still, I, mean, I would still say the majority of a producer-director, 
All right. Okay. Uh, on lower budgets, you normally get the director being the writer, director, producer, because it's just easier one person being in charge of the, of the whole thing. But, so but you even write... when you worked, even when you work with a producer, mm -hmm. you normally find that your role is kind of he helps you out with your role a little bit, and you help him out with his role a little bit. But yes, sorry. It crosses over, but you write as well. I write as well, which I helps. Which helps, yeah. yeah. I mean, writing was the first thing that I properly did in filmmaking, film-wise anyway. Actually, the first serious thing that I did was was learn how to screenwrite and then send off to competitions. And you know, I did quite well in a couple. You know, came second, came you know third, mm -hmm. got a special mention or whatever like that. Um, and then cameras, and then what happened, I think about 95, 96, DV cameras, digital video cameras came out. And that meant that you could edit, you could capture and edit without losing a generation. So how old were you then? Because we spoke about the 13, 14 year old, how old was I John Webster, <laughs> doing film with your mate. Yeah. And then this was how many? I mean, this is about, so um, 1996 roughly was when DV cameras, digital video cameras okay. came out. So what, I'm in my early 20s, okay. and, um, and for the first time ever, you could make a movie, film it, or you could film something, right? take it to a computer, capture it in, and work on it, and when you finished it, the quality at the end is exactly, almost exactly the same as when you started putting wow. the raw footage in. But back in those days, you had to shut everything down on your computer, you had to shut even Windows down, you had to go to Task Manager and shut everything down, so you just had the editing program <laughs> running, and then you could edit, and then you could output it. But that stop me from not stop me from writing I kind of went oh now I can move into filmmaking which, which is, is what you always which is what wanted I wanted to do. to do because now it's a consumer can do it now we can now make stuff that actually looks quite good quality at the back end and do all the sound mixing and everything on a computer whereas right. before that was very expensive to do did you ever do stunts I never did stunts. I did when so I was a kid. Was, yeah. <laughs> when I was a kid, well, I used to throw myself on my bike and jump off roofs. I and, think we all did, even, and, yeah, even and, me, yeah. And do all that kind of stuff like that, like the Crap McGraw, whatever it is. Not Crap McGraw, <laughs> that's a fighting thing. What's that one with free running when they run across oh, the... Oh, yeah. They used to run across roofs oh, and all that. It's got a name, doesn't it? My son wants to do it's it. It's called parkour? Parkour, yeah. He wants to do my 10-year-old to parkour. Yeah, like, yeah right. So ba basically, because mum's going to let you do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, go my, on, my son wants to do that as well. Yeah, they can so, do it together. <laughs> yeah. so Not. In, the, in the industry, I've been a sound guy, a camera guy, a lighting guy, a director, a producer, an editor. I think that's about it. Yeah. Actor. No. I have acted in bits and bobs just because. But do you know what? Don't you think that having done all those different elements, partly probably. I think, I would imagine in the industry, knowing the little that I do, that it's from necessity. It sometimes, is from necessity. Sometimes yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I'd much rather just be a director. You have the dream, yeah. but you do the bits that come along just so that you can pay the bills, so exactly. that you can get the experience. But actually what you've gathered along the way is invaluable. It's invaluable because, because it means you... that when that is why you can organic, organically let things run. Exactly, yeah. Because you know what it feels like to be there when things go wrong and mm -hmm. to be on that side and running the camera. You've experienced the other side yes. of it, which will make you an excellent director. Thank you. <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> I don't know what the, the end result will look yeah, like, yeah. but I would probably love to be directed by you. Well, I don't, won a, I won I don't know what you'd do. I'd probably be <laughs> flying spaceships <laughs> yeah. through, I don't know what. But, you know, I, I've but won that. a few competitions, so I think I'm oh. all right. I think, I, I what, think I've done all right in the past. <laughs> what competitions have you run? I've won, won Cri rather. Crystal Palace Film Festival mm -hmm. one. I've won, um, uh, I won one here in Bourne Wood actually last year, which was, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but Bournemouth Film Festival here. I've won a Japanese film festival, I think it was JVC, okay. back in the early 90s, mid 90s. What else have I done? Um, I won a BBC award for a, a short film that we did year. I can't even remember now. I don't really care that much about it. What's really funny is that the one award that I have got left, which was this like, um, it was almost like a, an Oscar, but they'd done it really, really well. <laughs> it was actually a really expensive piece of kit. And, um, and it was like, the, I had another glass one that I dropped and it smashed. Oh dear. Oops. The Crystal Palace one's actually a friend's got because we worked on the documentary together. But the other night, I was um, I was in my office at home, and there was a massive spider, and I just went oh, and I grabbed the the award, and oh, I went no, clunk, yes. and then both his legs broke, like that, and the award bent like that, and I was like, oh great, yeah. but that's that's the well, matter. Obviously, of it's not that precious to you. Well, it's not, I wouldn't have killed a spider. Would you know what happened to me in the, in the early years? I think I got very disillusioned because I think the competitions you go and turn up there. And, and I know it's just you sitting there going, well, that's your opinion. But some of the films that were winning, you just think, oh, my God. Mm. Oh, my God. I mean, right, maybe I shouldn't have won. But that other film there was 10 times better than that one there. 
And what you start learning, actually, is that the films that win awards aren't necessarily the best films. And they're not necessarily the kind of films that you would watch. And I'm, I mean, I'm a filmmaker. I love film. I live for film. I've never watched the Oscars. Not once. Really? Because majority, in my opinion, the majority of the films that win the Oscars, you never want to watch. Or you'd watch it once some and of them, that's it. I will be honest, some of them are very Awful. obscure. But then again, you know, I did watch a Schindler's List won loads of awards and mm. that was amazing. That's a great film. I mean, there are some you know, films are some that are great good. films that do win that do win awards, but the majority of the best picture awards and everything like that, in my opinion, go to, I don't know, just I mean, like self-indulgent crap. There are some very arty, weird... But I love arty and weird. My favourite genre is, is Donnie Darko, Mothman Prophecies, Vanilla Sky. I love weird films. So then I won't Matrix. pitch my idea to you. Too, too, too calm and normal. Too calm. <laughs> well, I don't calm and normal, but I love weird films. These are not weird well, films. That stretches you creatively. Yeah, these are films that are made deliberately, like the Coen brothers do, to win Oscars. Okay. They make a certain type of film that they know, like uh, No Country for Your Old Men and everything like that. They know it's a certain kind of film that will win Oscars. And, and that's my... That's my Thing, doesn't it? that pay though? Do you know? I mean, they do it because it puts what they're doing on a level that of then course, brings yeah, in the, the, the high budget investments. Of course and stuff it does. Like yeah, that. of course it does. Which but is, it's a horrible game, isn't it? You have to kind of. Yes, but that's the thing. It's a, it's a horrible game. And the horrible game is, is that I'm about. I'm about uniqueness. I'm about wrong creative hearts. I am. My life is about creativity. That's what I live for. That's what gives me my energy. That's what when I'm even when I'm depressed and I wake up in the morning and don't want to get out of bed, I start thinking creative thoughts about ideas. And that's who I am. I'm a creative person. And I have. It's taken me years to realise that actually, what am I best at? Being creative. You know, I can. Um, you know, I had a meeting the other day. Um, and uh, with Cliff, who runs this whole thing, and, you know, yeah. and the guy, the guy we had a meeting with, was just going, "Where are you coming up? Have, have you, have you, did you prepare for this meeting and and write notes?" And I was like, "No, so I'm coming up with the ideas right here and now." And he was like, "But how?" And I was like, "Because that's just what I, I couldn't understand why he was so amazed that I was just coming up with ideas and pitching mm -hmm. to him. Because for me, it's so easy. It's so." Simple, just to come up with ideas. Give me a situation. We want some ideas. A couple of minutes later, isn't I can... it great that everybody's wired a bit differently? Yes, yes. <laughs> quite, quite great that way. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, out of all the different things that you've directed or created or produced, film-wise, or I suppose anything-wise, we don't have to limit it to films, but that's the main thing we're talking about. What's the favourite thing that you've created? That you've done? What's your, been your, your your highlight, really? I don't think I've done it yet. That's the thing. Well, so far, let's let's. Let's not limit you to forever because the future, who knows what the future brings, but what have you worked on? Do you know, it's a really weird question because I don't feel like I've done anything of any significance, even though many people would say that. I don't feel like I've made it yet. I don't feel like, I mean, I've got friends who've directed one short film and oh, you've got the Facebook and they go, film director, producer, da 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 da, da. You know, I've got people who've done nothing and call themselves film directors and producers or have done... I've got people Are they who've done not doing that to position themselves to hopefully be found? Well, perhaps. at the end of the day, listen, it's not going to work like that. You're not going to say I'm a producer. Someone comes to meet you and go, "All right, what you produced," and, and you show them, you know, like a really low budget thing. They're just going to think you're a joke at the end of the yeah. day, and and that's the way it is. Is that and, and the way that I feel is that I want to go on at a professional level. I don't want to be running around. I mean, I most of the time when people say to me, like you said, you know, what, what do you do at the end of the day? I'm a producer and director. I don't normally say that. I say I run a small production company, that, that might be me belittling myself, but I think until I get to that dream, until I've directed a feature film, which has been my goal, so I've done everything but, I've directed and produced. So and you've done documentaries. I've done documentaries, done... music videos, TV adverts, corporate videos, um, uh, TV shows, game shows, you know, uh, pilots, I've done everything. So the future for you is to do feature a feature films. film. Feature right. films and feature do and, and documentaries as well, yeah. I feature think documentaries. Feature all... documentaries and feature films, but feature films is my goal. Feature it's films ultimate. is what I've always wanted to do, and I have had a few options to do it before. I had a chance to work with Jean-Claude Van Damme and Millennium wow. Pictures to direct a $3 million movie, but it didn't come about. One of my own movies, one of my own scripts that Jean-Claude Van Damme really liked, and nice. Millennium Pictures, who do Expendables and all that, lot really liked it, but we, didn't, we couldn't come to an agreement because... Uh, I didn't really want Jean Claude Van Damme to be in my movie. It was it was as simple as that. I always. Do you know what? Is it wrong if I agree? With yeah, you? I mean, I used to love him when I was a kid. I could give you a list of who I would like to see in yeah. movie, but not him. Sorry, well, the, Jean Claude. My, my issue no. was this: is that he wanted two million pounds for a three million pound budget. Oh no. And he also wanted a thing which was called pay and play money, which is I think it was two hundred thousand. So you give him two hundred thousand, and he he attaches to the project for five years or something so like that. So he gets royalties and stuff? Well, no, no, what it means is, is that obviously whenever you agree to do a film, the film, even if you get the budget or anything like that, still, something might go wrong or it might stumble. So what you're paying him 200 grand for is to 
is to sit around and say, look, this project's going to happen in the next five years. We've got you. No matter what, you have to commit to this project. So it's like a retainer. It's like a retainer, okay. but we don't get that back. Make okay. the film, don't make the film, you don't get that back. So you're talking now £800,000. You get £3 million and two million two hundred thousand has to go to Jean-Claude Van Damme. It's and, not and, worth it, and it's it? not worth it. And not just that anyway. How I didn't long ago want was Robert this? Because he's a bit... 2009. Okay, so he was a bit less... Not in the... He was a bit more visible then, wasn't he? Just about. Well, the reason he's got a TV show on ITV was probably primarily down to me. Because we had, an, oh, we had okay. a chat at Cannes and he was saying about um, wanting to be in a British film. And he was saying, oh, maybe I should do something like um, come onto a sitcom like I did with Friends in America. And we were saying, I just can't get my head, my, like the picture of him doing the splits over two chairs. I cannot ever get past that. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. And like, it's a very, sp I've typecast him in my own head, do you know. You know? What, what can you he did this film called J JVC, John claude Van Damme, and he did it in his own native language. And it was, and I tell you what, for the first time ever, you look at him, you can't act. You can't add that. was an amazing film. Okay. You know what I mean? I'll it's take a bad for it. Well, basically, he's playing himself and he gets kidnapped in a, in a bank robbery, right? Playing himself. Yeah. And then they try and make out that he's the bank robber. Or the bank robber trying to make, and it's just basically the interplay in what he does in it. And, um, and it's this one bit where he sort of raises, all of a sudden, in the middle of the film, he raises up into a chair and starts talking about his life, about who he is and where he's come from, all emotional. You know, and it's and about how he first got his break and everything like that. And then this chair raises back down again into the whole madness which is going on. And it is actually a really good film. And I saw it after I met him. Because I think I might have had a bit more respect for him if I'd met him after that film. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but the problem was that we couldn't come to an agreement. They wanted me to use this other guy called Scott Atkins. Scott Atkins, I think his name is. And if anyone watches martial art films, he plays Boris or something in some big martial arts film. But they showed me, here's this guy's show, and he couldn't act. Did you need a martial arts I didn't need a martial arts. Or a fighter well, or in anything? There's, there's, there's fighting in this film, but it's probably more like what you'd see in Bourne, in the Bourne stuff. There's no okay. big high kicks and flips and everything like that. And that's the thing about the Scott Atkins guy, was that's what he was, a high kick flipper, jumper, da da da. Couldn't act for Toffee, in my opinion anyway. And I'm sorry if you're watching this, Scott. You're probably a lot better now. But back then, you couldn't act for Toffee. And so there was, we kind of fell, not fell out, I think they were just like, well, nothing's going to please this guy. But my opinion was then, Dave, if I'm going to make a movie and it's based on my script, it has to be the best that it can be at the end of the day, and it has to hit the biggest audience. So you being... still, you're still holding on oh, to I've the script? Got, I've got, I've got uh, four feature films that I've written. They're all business packaged up. They're put into a slate. Um, this is what I spent the last two years doing. What um, does that mean? It means that basically the scripts have been written bar one. So we've got the scripts done. We've got the budgets done. So we've had a, a, non a line producer go in, work out, well, we've kind of said that this is how much money we're going to make this one for, this one for, and this Do one for. Do you know for. how much you need in order to yeah, make yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, so it's like a gradual. So uh, on this slate, we've got a, a low budget horror, which is 150,000, which is where we're starting. Because if you look at, um, uh, is the right word my peers? Is that, you look at my peers, so like you look at like, how did every major director start? Or how did every major production company start? So I went away to investigate and found out that horror was the biggest thing, right? So, really? Well, Steven Spielberg started off in horror. He did Duel first, and then he did uh, Jaws, which are both horror movies, right? But the class okay. is horror movies, yeah. yeah. The yeah, class yeah, is horror yeah, movies. Yeah. Peter Jackson did uh, Bad Taste, Meet the Feebles, um, and what was the other one he did? He did three horror movies. Mm -hmm. And so Peter Jackson did all the Lord of the Ring films and all that lot yeah, afterwards, yeah. Um, Hello. Sam Raimi he did all the Spider-Man films and all that lot. He started off with Evil Dead. Evil Dead 1, Evil Dead 2, and Evil Dead 3, right? Okay, horror movies. Okay, so I think it seems like a good way right? to start. So I started yeah. looking, and I was looking, I was going, look, the sensible, and w all right, so why do horror movies work? Because they sell all over the world, because horror movies are more about visuals than they are about the dialogue. So it doesn't matter so much that it's done in English, because it's horror movies, 80% of the films will be running around getting stabbed, getting the heads bit off, screaming. So that's why, so if you can do a horror movie in a low budget and do it really well. Well, horror movies are about special effects as well, not like effects, visual effects. Visual effects, more about the Which visuals. shows you being able to, 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 to create well, it something. It will sell quite, better. Yeah. You see, the sadness is, is that it's not really bad. I could be a genius director and I could be doing stuff that no one else is doing. But if my films aren't selling, no one in the industry is going to give well, a toss about me. Nobody sees them. Nobody yeah. sees them. Yeah. So what you've got to do is you have to play the game. You have to understand what the commercial side of filmmaking is. You have to understand where do films make money, what kind of films make money. And I'm not being funny. If you want, I mean, someone once said to me, if you want to make your own movies, right, and you want to make, a, say, a $50 million movie, your movie, first you've got to make a $100,000 movie, then you've got to make a $200,000 movie. For somebody else, this is. Then you've got to make a half a million dollar movie, then a $2 million movie, and so well, on and so on. And you've, got, up, yeah. you've got to build yourself up, because at the end of the day, you must realize that in the beginning, you might have to just take it. You might have to just 
you know, make big compromises that you might not want to make, but, but, but realizing that that's the route, that's the way to get it. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm trying to do is, is, is work from the outside. So I'm trying to, we're going to investors, we're, try, we're having a meeting with investors, we're trying to raise the money ourselves. So we don't have in our first couple of movies, we don't have that strict control. So we don't have anyone like studios or anything like that telling us what to do. We Which can do it our way. Which is a good thing way. nowadays. It's, it's possible nowadays. Yeah, it's isn't possible. It? yeah, of course it's possible. So the route is a low-budget horror. Then we've got Uriel, which is the one that uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme wanted to do, which is a supernatural action thriller. Uriel. Uriel, based on well, the name from Archangel Uriel, but it's not a religious film. It's a, it's a supernatural action film that has a big twist at the end. Um, I love the sound of it. It's thank just you. Like my, just just my your cup, cup of tea. Yeah. And then we've got... Without Jean-Claude Van Damme. Without Jean-Claude Van Damme. I'll give you a list of names <laughs> later on. <laughs> and then we've got Compound, which is, a, a, which is like another action film. Um, and we've got Jake Fortune, which is a 3D street dance movie, um, which oh, is again, nice. which is again looking at the commercial aspect. So we're saying that we've got a slate of films that we know that uh, that two of them are action films that do quite well. Next to horror, they do the, they do the best. And then one of them is a, is a street dance movie set in a parallel universe called Jake Fortune. And mm. um, we've already got half the budget for this movie. And this is the horrible thing about the film industry is. And you say you've got half the budget. We've got eight million dollars. Sitting there, waiting. Sitting for in an after account, and I think we've got six months left to match that funding, and the money gets taken away again. You have to match it in order you have to, to be match able it. to so use we've it. Got, they've, so a Canadian investment company have put an eight million into to an make them the, the dance, the, the 3D, 3D street dance movie. Okay. Because you've got to understand that 3D street street dance movies do really well. They do, and there's it's only really been well. a handful of them. It, I mean, from the Foot, UK Footloose anyway. Footloose isn't 3D, obviously, but Footloose went mental. Yeah. And then there are a few of them that have You've come along. You've got Step along. Up, Step Up 2, which is the UK version. Got, got to Dance. Got to Dance, all that lot, you know. I know, I've got them at home because I yeah. have a 15-year-old daughter. So we've got them and the 3D ones and we've got those nasty glasses mm. that you... The DVD. So they do they do quite well. And they I do, think they, every they, few years another one comes another along. One comes so why out. not but a what we futuristic was, one? Yeah, yes. yeah, we've got a futuristic one. We've got one that's based on a parallel universe when all and in, 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 in a non-geographical location. So a bit like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. You know, there is, there is no... Everyone speaks English, but it looks like a European town. And you, you don't know where Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory is based because it's non-geographical. And it's the same... We've got this thing called... This place called Pineapple Valley, which looks like England, but it's actually in, a, in, in the middle of the Nevada desert, which is surrounded by, like, you know, uh, mountain, well, it looks like the Nevada desert anyway. So you've got these London streets. And, and you wrote this one? I wrote this one, yeah. Well, I co wrote, well, I took over the writing. So there was an idea written down, and for us to come on, on uh, my company to come involved, because we were going to be um, basically like uh, supplying a service. We were going to put the business package together. We were going to help them raise the money, and so on and so on. But, but as we went down the line, I was like, I don't really work, work on a 3D street dance movie. It's not in me. And then I, met, I, met, I convinced them that if you go down, something that might interest me. Let's set up a parallel universe. Let's make it about technology. Let's make it different to all other street dance movies. Then you've got me. And they agreed. So I, I did what's called a page one rewrite. So we wrote the script from the beginning all the way through to the end again and completely rewrote it. Amazing. Don't laugh, but what's running through my head is, when do you sleep? Never. <laughs> How do you do all of this? Oh, my word. I'm it's working just... at the minute. I'm working probably, well, I am working seven days a week, roughly. I'm trying to do six. And I basically start at around about half ten, ten, and finish at about three in the morning every you, night. You see, you have to love what you do. You have to be able to do that. You cannot yeah. do that if you don't enjoy mm. what you do. You have to. But also on this movie, we've got um, Kenny Ortega. Mm -hmm. And Kenny Ortega uh, did Hocus Pocus. Yeah. He directed, um, oh my God, I'm going to forget the movies that he directed. He directed uh, two street dance movies, two big ones. Is it High School Musical? Oh, that they went direct through. High School Musical. Oh, it's him. I've seen the director because they had a thing where he, you see him preparing with. Yeah, he's, he's about fifty, there. I think, or so. He's quite balding, a typical Disney Channel <laughs> yeah. director. Well, have yeah, you seen Michael good. Jackson? This, this is it. Mm -hmm. He's the guy with the microphone. Okay. Going, okay, Michael. What we need you to do is this, this, this. That's Kenny Ortega. He's great. Though. He's Kenny got a real following though. He's, he's got an eye for what works. He's doing the new Dirty Dancing film. He's directing the new the remake of Dirty Dancing. Oh He wow. was also the um, uh, was he the second unit director on Ferris Bueller's Day Off and the dance choreographer on Dallas Ferris Bueller's Day Off and he was a dance choreographer on the original Dirty Dancing. So I think he's a dance. He's a choreographer, isn't that? Choreographer is now a film director and, and a producer. And so he did that. And school. you've got him. He signed up to my to, to executive produce my movie, 
And we've got uh, Travis Payne, who was Michael Jackson's dance choreographer, who again, if you watch this, is it? he's the tall, skinny black guy with a bald head all standing next to Michael, sort of breaking moves. Mm -hmm. And he's directed uh, music videos for Beyonce and, and uh, Justin Timberlake and stuff like that. He's the director. So what do you need to then be able, you need to find your eight million to match We need to find another company that's willing to match the eight million dollars. Uh, or a some big, person who's made it some big star who's made it who can put eight million for some of them is nothing madonna <laughs> yeah. 300 million eight million like well you think it was that like, that's what we were like when we first started but yeah it, we just got celebrities but celebrities at what are skin. price though <laughs> at what price that's the other thing if you bring in a celebrity at that level mm. you know somebody who's a pop star or who's known for their dance you know Paula Abdul, I don't know, I'm picking names out of... Celebrities nowhere. are always skin, trust me. Are they? Yeah, always No, skin. but it's also not that, it's the diva, the diva attitude mm. that comes with it and the sacrifices that you then have yeah. to make to make them the star of the show. And yeah. Well, that's what you have you to do. This know, is a game that we play. So when you work with celebrities, we, an industry we call them the talent. Yes. And, and it's a game that you have to play. The talent get treated like royalty no matter what, right? And that's what you have to do. That's what they get treated like. And this is why a lot of them do become... In my opinion, you know, divas, yeah. yeah, divas, yeah, because they're so used to being treated that way. But do I mean, they I'm, expect it? Oh Nowadays, God, I mean, I really should be saying this, but you know, I did, a, I did a music video with Russell Grant, and, and I'm sure Russell, forgive me if you've ever seen this, but you know, we we hired the largest soundstage at Elstree Studios, the same soundstage where they shot Star Wars. You know, the stop. I mean, there's photos in there, the Millennium Falcon, you know, sitting there, you know, in the studio, wow. and we were now filming a music video there. And what happened was that Russell turned up, and there wasn't a cup of tea waiting for him in his changing room. And he kicked off massively, you know. I mean, someone came down to me and said, "John, you have to go and speak to Russell because he's talking about walking out." You know, and people still work want to work with him. Well, right? you know what? And I'm saying he's a lovely, lovely guy ordinarily, but he's used to turning up and getting whatever he wants, sitting there waiting for him. And so my logic with that was, is that Russell, how are we supposed to know that? What if you like coffee? Oh, how are we supposed to know? And he was what? like, "Oh well, Does... it's unprofessional, you know." Da, 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 da. And you're like, but "Russell, you could get here, make your order, <laughs> and then you've got it." We don't know that you like tea or whatever you like or anything like that. But don't get me wrong. I wouldn't say it's Russell is a lovely, lovely, lovely guy outside. But he does have that diva aspect because he's just so used to it. He's used to turning up and getting whatever he wants. But that's our fault because that's how we treat the talent. Well, I guess that's... You want to keep them sweet and happy. You want to keep them sweet and happy. Without them, yeah. if they walk, then you've... Exactly. And you want the talent because that brings in the investment and the... And, and everything. So you think you, as you say, you've got to play the game, and that's part of You have of the to game. play the game. The, the sad fact is, is that when I first went to Cannes in 2009, I remember the first night of the whole day meetings, I nearly broke into tears because I was like, this is not what I thought it was. I thought I was going to go to Cannes and meet loads of creative people and talk about film ideas and talk about my ideas and their ideas. And that went to Cannes, it was money, money. What have you done before? Where's the money? How much money is it going to make? Where's your business plan? How much money? Money, Look, money, I'm, money, I'm, money. I'm, and I was like, it's taken me all that time to now to realize that it's, you know, I didn't know it was a business, but it is a business. And you cannot get caught up in fantasy of thinking, um, and then it's a bit harsh, of thinking, I'm going to write a film. It's going to be my complete idea. Someone's going to love it and buy it. They're going to give me millions of dollars. I'm going to direct it. <laughs> and that's where it's going to work. No, it's never, ever but happened. I like think that. ultimately, money makes the world go around. We need it to survive and you need it to perpetuate whatever your vision is or whatever your message is or whatever your dream is. So there's no getting away from it. You do have to find a way in order to live your dream. Yes. You have to find a way to make, you have make to, yeah. it earn for you. And unfortunately, the industry you've chosen, you're talking big money in order to be able to yes, make it. It's big money. Copy, or you sacrifice well, there's two elements. things here. We're heading into the hardest industry in the world to get into. I'm sorry, but it is. It is, right? It is, yeah. And I'm heading in at the top positions. I'm not heading in as an actor or a cameraman or this or that. I'm going which in as producer, director. Which are also very hard to get into. Which is also very hard to get yeah. into, don't get me wrong. But you think if you work on a movie, yeah, there's one director. How many actors is there? Exactly. How many camera operators is there? How many lighting guys, gaffers? So you're battling for that one job, right? And so there's, there's, compared to every other job in the industry, like producers and directors are like the top jobs, there's not very many, not but a lot of. you know what, John, I'm glad that you're still battling because oh, from the God, sound you've, you've got, got all these ideas and actually it just takes one massive, you've had lots of little breaks by the sounds of it I've here and there. I've done lots of really come. interesting stuff. I've had. It's like that, everyone knows, if you work for yourself, the, the thing that happens is you've got to understand is it's going to be like that. Right, you're not going to have it's that security. A but it's a battle worth fighting because ultimately, exactly. the, the who said that? Who said that? Failure after failure. If you can stick to it, still be enthusiastic after failure after failure after failure after failure after failure after failure, you're going to make it. 
And, and, and I'm not be funny, through all my years, I've, I've watched The Secret, I've listened to all these quotes and everything like that, and, and I've loved them, don't get me wrong, and I've, I've questioned and everything like that, but you know what, tenacity, through everything that tenacity. I've learned, tenacity is key. I don't care if you're the most, it, uh, when you take away money, stupidity, intelligence, everything like that, the, t the person with tenacity is more likely to make it than anyone else. Absolutely. And it's been proven, and I think you put up on the Sylvester Stallone story, which is a yeah. very famous one, and that is the sign, that, that is the ultimate in tenacity. It's stick to it, stick to it, stick to it. Believe that you're going to do it and make it one day, and you'll get it. Exactly what Stallone did, and that, you know, that Obviously, is I an amazing story. You never know what's around the corner. You could be giving up just before you get exactly. handed that golden ticket. What you was that? He used to say, Three Feet from Gold, I think, yeah. is a book from, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Napoleon Hill. And one of the famous stories I love in Napoleon there. Hill. You love Napoleon Hill. One of the famous stories in there. Well, Napoleon Hill, for me, is he got it. He understood what was going on, but mm. I want to get But the famous story is this Three Feet from Gold. So a guy mines for gold for years, buys all this big equipment, mines and mines and mines for years and years and years. Eventually just goes, oh, bugger it, that's it, I give up. Goes to some guy who buys all the old mining equipment and says to him, look, I've got a plot up here, I want to sell all this equipment. <laughs> I want to sell all this equipment to you. Do you want to buy the plot as well? Oh, I'll give you the plot. And so the guy goes, hold on. He calls his mate up and says, who's a geologist, and says, look, someone's trying to sell me this plot and all this equipment. Do you think it's worth it? And the guy goes, listen, I think, actually, with my calculation, you're probably about three or four feet away from gold. And he's like, you're kidding me. And he's like, no. He goes, buy it. Take it now. And so this guy, I think, 10 years, five, I'm just trying to figure this out, five years digging for gold, sells all his equipment to this guy. This guy takes the equipment up to the lot and within two days hits a gold band. And so the story's called Three Feet from Gold because you never, ever, ever know when you're three feet from gold. So that's why you should never, ever, ever give up on what you want to do anyway, unless it gets to that point where it's retarded, where it is like you just cannot move any further forward, you know, and, 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 and it's not likely that, like, you can't have a dream, I'm sort of saying that, oh, I'm going to build a spacesuit that's going to have rockets in its feet and it's going to take me to the moon. I mean, we all know that that's silly. No, but if you think about you, right, you've got all these different films and these ideas and you and you've probably got them because you've known when to to park it so you're not you have to know up. when to give up on you're something not, as well yeah. you haven't well i wouldn't even say you've given up on it you've parked it you parked it yeah yeah and then you move on but you've never given up on the ultimate dream no, you never give up you are yeah. still a filmmaker yeah exactly but what and I'm you trying keep to say, going yeah. and you keep facing some yes. of the yeses and some of the noes and probably lots of more yes. noes than yeses yeah. but you park the project yeah but not not the thing the well process. put it this way right i've got I've written six feature length screenplays, right? So if I, if I make it tomorrow, right? If I make, uh, if someone buys one of my scripts, then the other five scripts b before that will not go to waste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you understand what I'm saying? Because basically, is that, that they'll say to me, what you got next? And that's I what, go, I, that's there what you go. I was getting at. You just don't know when you're gonna get exactly. handed that golden ticket. And ultimately, you've got this whole repertoire, this whole collection of things that you've gathered over the years. and. You'll get to make exactly, them. Exactly. One, get, day, one day they will see the light oh, of day. Or I'll sell them and people will buy them. But what I was going to say, though, is that you have to know if you're involved in something and it's going haywire. You have to know when you're involved with people who don't know what they're doing and it's going mad. I mean, that only comes from experience. And then you have to know when to get out. And then the other thing that you have to do is you have to go, it doesn't matter how much work I put into that. It doesn't matter what I'm done because it's not, it, you it's can not. see that it's madness. And again, that does take experience to start realizing what are the mad projects that are never going to go anywhere. It's also confidence. It's very hard to stop when, when you're working on something that you so oh, believe Oh, God, yeah, in. but you get used to and it. And you, you think that you have it. Yeah. And also, but the thing is, if you know that you've given it your all, you know that you have given exactly. it your all and everything that you can give it, exactly. then you can park it then you can knowing... Park it. Yeah. That you've done the most yeah. that you've oh, And you can walk done. away from a project as well if you want to, if you, with other people, say, other people working on it, because all you have done is your best. And if it's have still you going. Have you given up too early, though? Have you ever thought, God, I wish I'd I stuck with. Whoa, well, the Jean Claude Van Damme, I should have. Well, thinking now, you know, if I carried on with that, at least I would have had a Hollywood you know, movie under my belt. I would have had a movie by Millennium Pictures with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a, well, a B list, a C list, a Hollywood actor in it. Look, he's it, gone, for whatever we've been saying, the man's really, you know, he's very well known. There's nobody. You would have made who yeah, knows who yeah, You would have exactly. done very well with it. Yeah, I would have yeah, done that. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, you know, there's big regrets. It's kind of to the horror movie. Yeah. And I walked off a TV show as well that we did with Jeff Brazier that I was producing um, because the, the infrastructure was mad. I mean, the way it was set up, um, the money people were just completely off the off their heads, in my opinion, you know, and, and, and they even had other people working it going, but John, you've done all this work, you've done all this, Channel 5 are, are like on the brink of commissioning it, you're going to walk away. And I was like, yes, because I have to. Because otherwise, so it's we're going to read about you in those apart. director's books and the man who walked away from everything until he got what he was going. Well, no, I walked away because, you know what it is, is that I'm very sensitive 
And when stuff starts making me feel anxious and making me feel like I can't communicate with people, making me feel like, not that I'm not in control, but that, that nothing I, I do is going to matter, you know, in this. And, and actually, it's making me feel anxious and upset. And I wake up in the morning and I'm upset. And what I've decided to do later on in life is not get involved in it. It's, it's, someone said to me, kill the beast when it's a baby. And that's live with me. If you can that's see it going thing. mad, if you can see it turning into a mad old beast, kill it when it's a baby and walk away. And that's what I've done that on a few projects. I've gone boom. Well, self preservation, and especially in this industry, is really you have important to, yeah. because sometimes you, if you look at the cost, in other words, with this Jean Claude Van Damme mm. thing, you had the budget, but he would have taken up a big chunk of mm -hmm. that budget. And then the chances are that as the director producer who is accountable, for the budgets and everything, you would have had problems on your hands. You may have never been able to finish. Well, you, it would have been, been what it is. It would have been a low budget film. And you didn't want to take that chance. So sometimes you have to make that call for yeah. the greater good. In yes. other words, it would have, the, the cost would have been too great to cost, you. The cost to, to the, me to might have been too great because I get, the way I've always seen it is if you can smash onto the scene and you smash on the scene, people go, oh my God. You know what I mean? Like, like in my opinion, like the Matrix, you know, when it, oh, all right, wow. dated now, but when it first came out, Everyone was like, Sorry. who directed this? Who done this? This film is amazing. I am a diehard yes. Matrix fan. Yes. Excuse me, I have done a marathon. Three in a row, in yeah, a row yeah. of a day. We arrived, I had to wear black. I mean, that wasn't my doing. I have to tell you, I have to just say. Agent Smith. Well, I know we had to wear black. I was apparently meant to bring sunglasses. I forgot them. I arrived. My friend had fished out all the M&Ms. Yeah, yeah, we had yeah. the blue pulls and the red pulls. Yeah. It was amazing. Well, you see, which is fine, which kind of brings us to, to my, the documentary that I'm working on at the moment, which is called Straw Man Nature the Cage, which is uh, actually the Wachowski brothers, when they were writing The Matrix, is actually what they were talking about and what they were doing. What, sometimes in a movie, you can get your truth out, but you have to cover it. You can't blatantly say what's happening, and so you cover it. And so you make up a cover story to, to represent right, what's actually going on. And I can't think of, there's a word that, that basically, that means what I'm saying, but it will make it nice and simple for everybody. Um, and so the- It's the innuendo. No, well, it, what it is is that, that when they say, all right, my documentary, Straw Man, Nature, the Cage, the new one, is about um, the law and the legal system. Now, we did a documentary a couple of years ago called Resonance, Beings of Frequency, which was about mobile phones and the possible harm, the possible effects that it could cause cancer or um, harm the body through the, the radio frequencies and the electromagnetic frequencies it's coming out from mobile phones. very topical. People are interested. Oh, yeah, yeah. It did, that documentary did really well. It went on YouTube for three months, and it got 600,000 hits in three months, a 90-minute documentary. Oh, wow. Then we got a distributor, and so obviously it had to come down off YouTube, and it got distributed all over the world. You know, it, did really, it got shown at the UN. It got shown in, uh, I think, the, the, you know, that Canadian parliament when the shooting mm -hmm. just was? It got shown there in Canada. Oh, that's and someone said to us that the, the, the SAR rating, which is specific absorption rate, um, of radio frequencies was lowered in Canada as a direct result of our documentary. Now that's hearsay. I haven't heard that directly from the. I can from imagine the it with because Canadian and America and they kind of take things a bit more seriously. They're yeah. worried about their health. And they're worried about their They're a lot more health aware. Yes. Um, or, or take with more responsibility for it. Yeah. Than I have found people here to do. <laughs> well, what, what we say that to tax, <laughs> as tactfully as possible. We well, see what we found was is that you would think that making a doc, if I said this, you said to you we're making a documentary about the possible carcinogenic effects of mobile phones. What people instantly think is just putting a mobile phone here. I'm going to get cancer here. Some people, women, put it in their bras. I'm going to get cancer on my boob. Put it in my pocket. I'm going to get cancer here. That's not what we found. And I'll do it very quickly because this is like the core of the documentary. I can move on to the next one. And what we found was is that the brain. Uh, the pineal gland in the brain right here produces a thing called menotolin. Mm -hmm. And menotolin is like the body's natural wonder drug. It mops up free radicals. And free radicals are uh, electrons that are left over from cell mitosis. And cell mitosis is obviously when your cells are repairing themselves or when they're, um, uh, uh, yeah, and when they're, the next generation of cells come along. These electrons are, are left floating around your body, and they're called free radicals. And scientists say that free radicals are probably the number one cause of all cancers, if not all, dis all disease. Um, so why is it getting worse in this day and age, and why could mobile phones be affecting this? Well, it's because um, all mobile phones are electromagnetic-based, which means they're photon-based. So if you're in your bed at night time, and you put your mobile phone next to your bed, and it's every now and again it's sending out you know, um, electromagnetic frequencies, then your pineal gland to produce melatonin has to detect one that it's dark, and that's why it's right in the center of your brain. It has light sensors because it's so close to where, where the eye cavities are. 
and even in some lizards and stuff, the pineal gland has a lens and a coroner. Coroner? <laughs> <laughs> What's the word? Not cor coron. Cor uh, cornea. 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 Yeah. cornea, thank you. As I was thinking of the beer now. <laughs> corona. As a cornea no, and, a, and, a, and a lens. But anyway, <coughs> it has to detect that it's night time. And it also has to detect that the, bottom, the body's motionless. And that's because the melatonin works the best when you're not moving and you're mm. sleeping. Um, so what happens is if you've got your mobile phone or your, or your Wi-Fi in your room, the electromagnetic waves coming interfere with your pineal gland, it thinks it's still daytime and doesn't produce melatonin. And so your body, the wonder drug that your body needs is not activated. And, and recently in, in mainstream media, they've said that if you've got a light outside your house, like a street light, that's a carcinogen because it's not, it's stopping, it's inhibiting the, the producing melatonin. What it's stopping your body from... Uh, producing melatonin actually, yeah. and flushing out the free radicals, which are the primary cause of cancer. Okay. And night shift is going to be reclassified as a carcinogenic because the same thing, you're not getting the darkness, you're not, get, you're not lying in darkness motionless unless you've got a really good blackout window in your, in your house and you're not producing melatonin. But, you need um, that for your body to fight fit and to fight. fight cancer, to fight cancer, to fight uh, disease, to fight everything. Sounds amazing, an amazing, amazing documentary. Yeah, and that one's called Quite Resonance good. Beings of Frequency, and the new one that we're working on is called Straw Man: Nature of the Cage, which is about three months away from being uh, completed. Excellent. And that's covering the law and the legal system. So I let you get off very lightly, but I'm going to backtrack. What that you have created so far oh. is your favourite. <laughs> I haven't forgotten. Let you go off on a tangent, but I would love to know. Oh dear, I just because you know what? I'll you know, it's tell terrible because I don't. I don't. I, I think when when you're someone like me, probably like you, I think what pushes us forward, what keeps us going, is that we haven't achieved it yet. We haven't done the great and thing I, yet. And I'll we let haven't. you. I will <laughs> let you have that. But I'm very much also about you allowing yourself to appreciate your achievements thus far. So this is just about looking back and going, right, this is how far I've come on this journey. Look, I'm quite proud, and it could be all of them, John. Like to be honest, I think this documentary I'm working on now is probably the best thing that I. Is that because you're present to it now? I'm or present. Is that... no, I'm, I think because it's the most important thing that I've ever done. This documentary is going to save lives, and it has saved lives already. I've stopped people from committing suicide. I have done that myself before the documentary has even come out. I've stopped people from killing themselves because, because of, of the what? knowledge that I have, that I have about society, about money creation, about banks about owing anyone money, about breaching contracts. This the is what this whole I, thing is about this money. This is what it's about. Well, basically, I, I, knew, I, I knew that basically that all the acts and statutes and contracts in this country for a very long time are consensual. And I've always sort of known this, and I didn't really research it. Then I started researching it, and I found out actually that they're consensual, and we were tricked to every angle to, to consent to statutes and acts and contracts and everything like that. And, and then I found out that the money creation is fraudulent and that when you go to a bank and you borrow money, you create the money for the bank, not the bank, right? You create what's called a promissory note. When you sign your agreement, not your contract, remember it says a loan agreement, uh, a credit card agreement, because I can't call it a contract because it's not a contract because it's fraudulent, right? And so when you go in there, you create what's called a promissory note. And a promissory note is, is or, or a bill of exchange, whatever you want to call it, is anything that has an amount, a name on it, an amount, a date, and a signature. And that's what's called a bill of exchange or a promissory note. And so when you go into a bank, the only thing they ask you for if it's an unsecured loan is your signature, isn't it? I mean, the only thing they say, you, you do that. your credit checks and all the rest of it, but you just sign for it. You so sign your for it. What is the name of this document? It's called Straw Man. You the said nature, it so many times, so right. I want to say it. Straw Man, the, the nature. nature of the cage, because obviously the straw man is, uh, uh, is a thing called the legal fiction. Have you ever heard of that? I've heard of it, but I won't. The legal fiction. But I won't be able to die. Basically, this is not what the whole documentary is about. You know, the name might just change the nature of the cage. I think some people have been confused because they think the whole documentary is going to be about the straw man or about the legal fiction. But it's not. It's a very small part, and it's the foundational information that you need to understand moving forward about this massive scam that I and, uh, and other people have discovered. Um, so, do you think the name will. Does the name sell the documentary well? Does it? It sells it well for the people who know. It doesn't sell it well for the people who don't know. So, maybe you need a sub. Well, we've got it. So we've got uh, straw man, nature of the cage, and we did have the, the biggest secret in the Western world. But we think that that's, I don't know, it's, it's a good, but it sounds a bit, not incendiary. It doesn't, incendiary, tell, it sounds me, too, doesn't I don't tell you know what, what it is. Yeah, it yeah, needs to exactly. tell people what it's about. And it needs to be, because that is such a deep topic, given the current econ economy, yes. the climate worldwide. Mm -hmm. 
that I think it needs to be very specific. Yeah. Yeah. Don't shy away from being very specific. If I can give you my two cents. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, this is the thing. Get, is spe is get specific because I'm your general yes. person. I'm interviewing lots of different people. But I don't know that industry. Yeah. But I do know I've experienced debt. I know many people that have also who feel locked into into the system, can't see a way out. And, and I bet they're depressed and I bet they're, so. they're suicidal, some of them as very well. Much so. Exactly. And this is what, this is what and I've learned. There's a learned. lot of lying and, and relationships damaged because of it. You just, it's just so everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. It's everywhere it's, it's at every level that if your documentary is catering for that, it needs, it needs to, to say, say that. It well, this is this is what we're title, getting to, yeah. So that the companies, also the film companies, or the TV channels, wherever you're going to pitch it to, they need to know what it is without having to. Because I think well, we, this, we think we need to be so full of innuendo yes. and get clever when actually. Well, for there TV, has to you're one hundred percent right. For TV, when you pitch to TV, the name now because it's a different industry. It was a seven hundred and a TV stations that your name has to say what the program's about. You know, uh, sixteen and pregnant. With all those Six, sixteen and pregnant. You know, um, a big my big fat gypsy wedding. The title tells you what the show is about. Yeah. For this documentary, it probably won't get on the TV. It's, it's Why not? because it's so incendiary. It's so we're teaching people that the government is below you and our servant. They've had things. But people don't know. Ish. People They've fundamentally had... don't know this though. They don't fundamentally. What we're teaching <coughs> people is, is that the government, and even when I tell you this, you will know this, the government is your servant. It goes like this. It goes God, man, the government. Now, I'm not religious, but that's how it goes. God, man, government. So anything government does is the creation of man. They create a thing called statues and acts. They are a creation of man. They can never be above man. The laws of the, of the, of the country, which is um, harm, injury, loss, and be, uh, don't be fraudulent in your, con in your contracts, anyone can understand that, and that's the law, and it comes from God. It comes from canon law. It comes from the Bible, everyone would call it. That's called natural law. But God is above man, so man must adhere to it. Statues and acts and anything created by the government is, is a creation of man and hence can never be above man. But what the government do is they trick you at every aspect to sign documents, to agree to things. They use legalese and confusing wording like I'm doing with a parking ticket at the minute. And they call <laughs> me the motorist, the keeper and the owner. Now that's three different people, but they keep, they keep and this is what they do to confuse you. They try and get you to admit to one of these, right? Yeah. And, and they do it really confusingly. So I write letters back to them going, who do you think I am? Do you think I'm the keeper, the motorist, or the owner? Because you keep saying, one letter is the motorist, one letter is the owner. They must love you. One letter is the, but this is what we do, we, we rebut presumptions. We say to them, look, at the end of the day, who do you think I am? What, you're, what it looks like is you're trying to entrap me. You're calling me three different people, right? Because this but, is what you are doing. You're trying to trap me into saying that I'm the owner of this vehicle. But I want to ask you, why can that show not be on TV? Why not? Because the tea is too incendiary. You're, it's anti-government in a sense. And it's anti-government to the point... Shown, they have shown things. I know that... No, I know they show things that are anti-government, but always in a certain boundary. I mean, there's nothing you've ever seen. There's no, you've never seen in your life someone sit down and go, I can tell you how to get out of debt without spending a penny in three months, how to be every park, car park in ticket, every speeding fine, anything that falls under so statutes. I want to acts. watch that, but how am I ever going to know that it's out there? Because it's going to be distributed. So we'll get a distributor, the distributors will put advertising out there, they'll get it out there. Distributed where? All over the world. So, back to being a director, because okay. we're on the creative, kind of, we've sure. gone off on many tangents. <laughs> we have, yeah. Uh, if you could give advice to somebody watching about this path. If like you, they're, okay, they won't be a seven-year-old necessarily, <laughs> but if it's something that they're working towards or they're dreaming of doing, what, could, what would you say to them? I would just say, um, go for it, you know, and don't listen to people like me who, and this is what I used to hate when I was younger, they'd go, oh, don't, it's the hardest thing in the world, you're just going to, it's going to be, unless you've really got the tenacity, just don't do it because, and I used to sit and watch famous directors or famous people doing that stuff, and I go, it's fine for you, sir, because you're bloody there, you know what I mean, you're already there. I would say that, go for it, and make sure that you've got, because I'm not being funny, creativity and, and this kind of work, you need to be a natural. And so it's like I had to accept years ago that I'm not a singer and I could never be trained to be a singer because I realized that, that I find out that it's actually to do with the makeup of your throat. And that some, you're born with yeah, it. You're either born, you can I sing or you can't sing. I didn't get the singer's you, throat yeah, You I'm can be trained you. to sing, but you're never going to be a great singer. <laughs> great singers are born with it, right? And great directors are born with it. And, that's all, and, and I think that's what I can say is, is that you must understand and know that you're not just going to look at it and go, John I Lester. want to be a director because I can be rich and famous and I can go and hobnob with all this and do all that. And it's just something I fancy. No, it has to be in your blood. And when it's in your blood and you're born with it and you're a natural and these things come naturally for you, go for it.
And that's that would be my advice. Go for it. And like everyone says, you know, don't listen to any negative sides of it. Just create. And in, and in this day and age, it's so easy. You can make a film on your mobile phone. You can make a film twice the quality of what I could have made when I was making proper films back in the 90s, just on your mobile phone. So there is no excuse. So your advice is just go for it. Go, go make films. It. If you're at film school, how you'll get ahead of everybody else is in the evenings, you're making your own movies. At the weekends, you're making your own short films and you're putting them into, you're using the friends that you've accumulated at film school who are interested in what you're doing and you make films above and beyond what you're doing at film so school. In a way, it's be creative with your creative whatever thing that you're working on. Be creative, be creative and just find do. solutions, find ways. And another question before we end off, you are talking with so much passion and energy and Thank enthusiasm you. and I love it. Is this how you always are? Yes. You're always full of energy and life yes. and passion or yeah. do you have some down times I as well? I, you know, like, um, I have like everybody, you know, it's like uh, uh, in the last couple of years, last year and a bit or so I've been working on my own. So I used to always have, I ran a production company called Blank Canvas Media. It was based in Watford on Clarendon Road and I had like four members of staff and then when I moved in 2010 to Elstree Film Studios, I still had like two producers working with me, a, a, a PA, you know, and people, graphic designers coming in and out in the office. And then when I uh, finished the shooting the documentary about a year ago, that's when I went, you know what, I'm going to shut the office down next door. I, went, I got into a bit, bit of financial trouble, not trouble, but I had to shut the office down, I had to get rid of my, the staff that I had and go at it alone. And so for the last year and a bit, I've been at it on my own. And so what can happen is that some days, you know, when you're on your own, I mean, I still get hired to go and direct over here and do you know, editing and stuff like that. I still meet people and go out and do talks and everything like that. But I think what can happen is you just all of a sudden you get these thoughts, I'm all by myself. Look at what I'm tackling. I mean, at the minute I'm working on a feature length screenplay for another production company, a big production company. I'm working on a 90 minute edit for a documentary, right? Um, I'm working on a music video uh, proposal and project um, for um, a, a, a music band from Prague. I'm working on two TV shows, right, where I'm a producer on, and, and I can't remember what else, but I, got, and I was looking You're at that going- You're doing this all on your own? All on my own. All on my own. So we so. are very, very <laughs> yeah. lucky to have you here. Yes. <laughs> John Webster. <laughs> Thank you. It has been amazing. I don't even know what, how to describe what just went on here. <laughs> I feel like we could have kept going to three o'clock in I the morning. Like, well, how long have we been going for? <laughs> About nearly two hours, wow, I reckon. Wow, that feels like it? 20 minutes. Isn't it? It's almost two hours, I reckon. An hour and 20. An hour and 20. An hour and 20. I reckon, you know what? We could have kept going till three o'clock yeah, in the morning. Because so, I'm yeah. just so... I feel cool. like I haven't said anything. <laughs> You probably have and you probably haven't because I think you've got a lot more to say. Yeah. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you for Thank coming you in. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing everything and more. Yes. <laughs> Can I say one last thing? Go we on. are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams. And that's my last bit of advice. You've been watching the Creative Heart Show. It has been an absolutely cracking, cracking episode. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Please remember to communicate with us on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and, and everywhere, really. We want to hear from you. The show is about our creative community here in Hertfordshire. And if you're not in Hertfordshire and you're inspired by what you've seen in the show, please get in touch as well because obviously creativity spreads the globe. Thank you for watching The Creative Heart Show with me, Ronnie Gerber, and my special guest, John Webster. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.